to uh, Siren Festival on this sunny, very beautiful day. Uh, really excited to have this session all about uh, if we should let our countryside go wild. Um, from my perspective, except for Ireland and Britain, we've suffered more deforestation and lost more mammals than any other European country. So this is a really cool topic, which I'm excited to be chairing. Um, the guys are going to be looking at rewilding, new approaches to conservation and positive land uses. So I'm going to introduce your panel today. So first up, we've got Tom and Harvey, who are from the Celtic Reptile and Amphibian Company, which are working to rewild Britain uh, to restore reptiles and amphibian species that have either gone virtually extinct, locally extinct, um, in the country and impressively they are hoping to build or they are building uh, the largest breeding centre in the UK which is big. Um, we also have Hugh Summerlayton who is Wild East founding trustee, uh, regenerative farmer, rewilder, conservationist, owner of Summerlayton Estate and trustee of Wild East. Um, he's also the president of North Suffolk, NSPCC, Lowestruft, Lowestruft Lifeboat and the Lowestruft Scouts, which is uh, huge. Oh, there you go, spotlighted. Um, we have Felix Alred, who is photographer from, from Suffolk. Great, great photographer. Uh, uses wider angle lenses to photograph and film wildlife and natural landscapes. His work appears in Suffolk Magazine and he will be a judge for the Suffolk Wildlife Trust photo competition this year. We have Martha Chalting, who is a ecologist and uh, studied zoology. <laughs> Here, Martha. Uh, volunteered on programs with elephants in South Africa and at Koala Sanctuary in Australia before becoming a wildlife ecology trainer with Bucks. Barks and the Ox and Wildlife Trust, where she contributed to the Water Vol Recovery Project and the, va the Badger Vaccination Program. Tom Peer, Forage and Folklore Suffolk. Hi, Tom. Uh, so it lives in the heart of Suffolk countryside. Uh, Tom and his partner combine their knowledge and passions for folklore and conservation to create and share a very unique and rewarding tour guide experience uh, to anyone wanting to discover the unique wonders of the Suffolk landscape. Uh, combining ecology, identification of edible and medicinal plants uh, found on location, uh, as well as corresponding historical anecdotes and the forgotten folklore tales and traditions surrounding the plants and animals that you would come across. And we have, who have I got? Um, is that everyone? I feel like I've serviced everyone. <laughs> Robbie Still, sorry. Uh, ecologist, uh, oh yeah, of course, ecologist uh, having worked for the Thames Valley Environmental Record Centre, identifying areas of the tree planting and developing natural recovery network. And you're about to start a new role with Kent Wildlife Trust, 
for the rewilding and reintroduction projects, including bison, who I'm sure everybody watching has probably heard about or seen uh, in the news or on social media, because that's huge. Brilliant, got there. All right, hi everyone. Um, lots of people are saying hello from, hi from sunny Norfolk. Um, looking forward to lots of nature and looking forward to the session. Awesome. Okay, so now we've done a vague introduction. Uh, we're gonna head straight into a poll, which is, why should we let our countryside go wild? So possible answers are, Reverse species extinction, tackle climate change, human health and well-being, reclaiming wild spaces from human destruction. Okay, great. I think we've got that in. So reverse species extinction is obviously a winner here. Um, Hugh and Tom Pierre, I thought this might be a good one for you. So why should we let our countryside go wild? Do you want, who do you want in which order? Uh, Hugh, should we start with you? Obviously, it'd be great to hear what you think with regards to um, wild. Yeah, so thank you so much for your introductions and, and for including me on this panel. Nice to see everybody. And uh, Tom, I know we've been trying to connect, so uh, in, indirectly, nice to see you too. I mean, I, I think um, from my point of view, when we kind of started Wild East, the the big, of course, the big sort of thing that's not probably talked about enough is there's a lot of experts doing incredible things around the country, and in this case, around the East, for, in terms of um, trying to save nature. No, not now, I'm just no. Okay, sorry, my daughter. Um, and but but uh, in in essence, we're trying to change kind of our culture, I think, because you can't. I mean, you can carry on protecting small places, and there always be some incredible people, like the people on this panel, who will endeavour to to do this and put their life, um, dedicate their lives to it. But actually, unless we all kind of reconnect re and and sort of slightly change our culture to being more connected. And, co and, and understanding the kind of coexistence, the need benefits for humans, but also for wildlife, um, then we'll kind of probably continue to fail. So allowing wilding or wilding our countryside is, is, a, is a sort of seismic step towards that process, because just taking some lightning as an example, we've started changing our, uh, the way we do things here. And I don't think anyone's criticizing in a, in a in a, in, I mean, in a, a, anything other than trying to be constructive, but people who, who know this area and visit this area as tourists think it's a mess. <laughs> and I mean, that, that tells you all you need to know about how far we've come away from uh, seeing nature as something to rejoice in and to, and to enjoy and to find beauty in. We find beauty in human control old landscapes. That, um, and, and I think for me, that what the essence of that is going back to the very, very dawn of man when we were literally terrified of our natural surroundings and, and created fire and space to, to be able to see and, and save ourselves from predators and, and that kind of thing. It's almost for me like an, a, like a, an old hangover of this, that when we start my, flow, fly mowing the, the front lawn and, and slashing things down, it's, it's just almost like a, a nervous shock to our earlier selves. And, and actually we don't need to do that anymore. There's nothing to be frightened of. And, and so, so I think for me that's the big that's the big reason it's it's to allow to part of the retraining of our of our souls to see nature as beautiful in in all its tumbling chaos. Yeah, amazing. And Tom, uh, Tom, over to you. Yeah. So I'm um, to be perfectly honest, um, kind of echoing what you said and just adding to it. I mean, that's really what we're all about here with our work and stuff, right? We're we're all about you know reconnecting people back to the soil really and back to the the landscape um and yeah it's it's a cultural shift that has to happen um you know um that's actually why on the poll um i don't remember exactly the the answers and things but i i did answer the one um about the more related to humans because i think in 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 our humble opinion it's really um important i think i think that's an important part of where, where we kind of fall short a, a lot in terms of 
folks who we're all like-minded, we all want to save animals and save the environment and things. But I think we always have to bring it back um, to the fact that, you know, um, people are involved and we have to involve people no matter what. And as Hugh's saying, it's, it's, it's a, a cultural shift. It's a, um, a, a systemic shift, whatever you want to call it. But um, it's, it's all about, um, for me, rewilding is more than just, uh, just about the wild space. It, it has, it has a holistic um, thought to it, in my opinion, in that, you know, um, I just heard the other day uh, or a few weeks ago about um, folks are, are putting in um, like plastic hedges and plastic grass. Like, I don't yeah. they, they talk, talk about, talk, talk about a, a disconnect from what, what, nature is and and our relationship with it right um um you know we should be promoting actual hedgerows and things and 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 working with nature instead of trying to close ourselves in um where where we've gotten so comfortable indoors and and things like that so um yeah to me the, i mean the, the question is right why is it important to rewild our countryside i i think i think the importance is to bring people back to to an understanding, not just not just a basic understanding, but a relationship with um, what nature is and how it should function. Yeah, uh, Hugh, would you say that that's a bit of a drive as well uh, for your Wild East project about being able to work with uh, the communities, you know, rewilding as a more holistic, broader approach? Um, yes, I think that's right. I mean, we we three are farmers, so sort of middle aged farmers, and. We've all been endeavouring to change the way we do things on our farms. We're all, all our three tr uh, founders are all old friends, and we kind of sort of woke woke up. We were on a trip, and we just got and as it happened, but we kind of realised that we could carry on doing this very happily, keeping ourselves happy with our own personal uh, contributions towards um, you know doing na nature recovery on our on our patches. But but actually. A lot of people have been doing that all around East Anglia for for a whole generation and, and failing. And the fact the, re the reason we're failing is because it's not culturally endemic and normal. The normalisation nature is, uh, and so the map of dreams, which is our kind of current centrepiece, is you know it, you know a lot of farmers sort of look very uncomfortable when you mention the word dream. <laughs> we've got to talk. I think we have to talk about map a map of farms for, for to a certain degree to keep keep it real. But the, it is exactly that you know, and, and giving someone very kindly flatteringly wrote in i think the in independent we launched it was while well, these were trying to democratize nature and, and i mean we didn't set out to do that but it's a nice has a nice ring to it is, is everybody has a stake and more importantly than that so whether you've got a 10 foot backyard or a balcony through to a, a churchyard and a school and a farm it, actually we all need to do this together because you know we've, we've kind of run out of time as far as uh, climate change and so it's but but for me for, for the there's a lady in south world who got in touch quite early on who's who's sending a sweet thing saying i've been so inspired by you guys and i'm pulling up my flagstones in the front garden to allow nature back in and that simple act mm -hmm. in a tiny area is 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 also potentially the catalyst for a whole range of different uh changes in character uh, cultural and character changes in that person and if that then ricochets down the street and then across the town you know that's how these things happen you know we've all we've absolutely shown with covid uh that we can act together and you know i think we mustn't lose sight of the uh, sort of terrifying irony that that if we put one sliver of a percent of the effort we put into covid and protecting ourselves you know and we, we like any species we're selfishly uh, program to protect ourselves into nature recovery we wouldn't have had covid and we wouldn't have a, a whole range of other ecosystem collapse issues and that that i think is should be the story that comes out of covid19 really but yeah that's right we want it to be about everybody and, and make everyone feel what that their little uh, um, contribution is worthwhile yeah and you mentioned generations and part, part sorry what was that sorry no, no, and, and part of something better, but, you know, so well, I think Wild East wants to be, was that expression, you know, greater than the sum of its parts, but, you know, yeah. as in, you know, if there's suddenly 10,000 10 foot gardens with their flagstones pulled up, that actually becomes seismic. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. And it is a valuable um, lesson and, uh, for the other yeah, generation. Sorry. 
<laughs> Don't worry. We're going to move uh, on and we're going to play uh, a video uh, which is called Voices of the Young Generation. So I think things that you both touch on is dreams and uh, the younger generation. So I think this will be good. <laughs> What would an alien notice first about the Earth if it landed here? Um, probably like all the buildings. What would an alien notice first about is uh, yeah. Yeah. about the Earth a bit like yeah. probably the atmosphere yeah. 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 is different, but there's a point. To where an alien would come from, you think? But what else would be different about the planet, you think? Um, so we all got one then. Um, yeah. the yeah. animals uh, we really see, mm -hmm. uh, the plants. Yeah. yeah. Anything? Do you think they'd notice that anything no, that wasn't natural? Like, there's no on the um, buildings and stuff. Like that. Yeah. Okay. What would an alien notice first about Earth if it landed? Water. 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 Why do you think water? Because, because it's mainly it's water. water. It's blue, and most of the thing is water, and the other thing are land. Do you think? Do you think water is important then? Yes. yes. Without it we'll do it. At some point. Because then. wait, they aliens don't have water because they don't yeah. really No, like. but do you think that at some point aliens will start noticing buildings and plastic and stuff? Oh uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean I mean like if they were looking down at the planet they see the water first. Yeah, yeah definitely. definitely. Okay. Space. I mean they, what, what would you want them to notice? No, they would see the uh, earth first. Do you think there was special oh, thing yeah. the like, um like the water and the land, yeah. not yeah. plastic. We're done then. What do you think is the biggest threat to the environment? I could imagine this. Um, do you think the biggest threat to the environment? Plastic modifiers. So are, th are those mostly things that the humans have? Yeah. What does the question say? What? Because plastic, like the humans drop it yeah. and they make it. And the wildfires, we don't always like taking the office start with plastic from the sun reflecting on the plastic okay. or glass. Do we all agree that oil. we think plastic's the biggest yes. threat? Yes, but one of the reasons... I think that um, the um, greenhouse gas is one of the biggest because I feel like it's quite a threat that the whole world could become covered in Humans the Humans are the biggest yeah. threat to the world. Yeah. yeah, I think you're right. Yeah, yeah. 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 Like, yeah. like, plastic is one of my biggest concerns because that is starting to compress down in the ocean. What's your favourite place to go for a walk? Mm. Oh. What do you like about the forest? We need to put more attention to the nature because it needs to be saved. Oh, yeah, wonderful. That's great. You like walking in natural environments. Lovely. Okay, go pick your next cute. What's your favourite place to go for a walk? No. Oh. Mine in the park. In the park. What do you like about the park? Ah, well, it's um, in Wendelson Park, it's got like this big ditch Great. that we, um, like, it's like it got a, we pretend there's an alien that crashed it. So. Perfect. So you find that really exciting? Yeah. Where's your, what's your favourite place to go for a walk? Oh, I like right in the seaside because like, you can see all like the dunes and the sea. I like taking a walk in my bedroom. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like taking a walk in the forest with my dog because she can smell everything. Yeah, and it's like I, a nice, beautiful area. So it's not too setting. Yes. What's your favourite place to walk? Around my house because I live in a very, in a in an area with a lot of wildlife mm -hmm. and it's very clean. Eight. Do you think it's as good, important to go out for daily? Yes, because yes. you can get your exercise done and um, you can get fit. Do you think it's important to go outside daily then? No. Well, she doesn't think so because they're good at the mod. Wait, what are you all doing? <laughs> I said, um, free shed. Um, free shed. Titan's good thing. Well, I well, think it is because you get. Yeah. I mean, like, like you get right fresh now, air. Right now, are you enjoying the fresh yeah, air? Yeah, because you're fresh air. We're not running so much. Actually, no, because you could die for that time. Yeah. Okay. I enjoy um, going outside daily because it can help the plants and it can get you fitter. Okay, okay, be so Do you think it's just important to go outside daily? Yeah. Yes, because I think it's important to go outside So for your health as well? And, your, and do you think it's good for sort of your head to go outside and yeah, very good, very good answer. Do you think it's important to go outside daily? It is because you get more oxygen into your lungs if you're outside than you're inside. 
Yeah. And you can get exercise outside. Are you feeling that at the moment? Yeah. Yeah. Good. <laughs> yeah. You're all very, very good. Too. Yeah. So what do you think the most important thing about being outside is? Um, um, oh, fresh air. Fresh air. Oh, fresh air. Yeah. Definitely. And do you prefer seeing, would you prefer being outside in a big urban area or where there's loads of, loads of uh, buildings or out in the countryside? Out in the country. Well, it was great to hear their very enthusiastic answers whilst running crazily around. Um, but it does just show you how important it is that our influence on the younger generations uh, is. We're now going to head straight into a bit more of a peaceful video to help bring the energy down a little bit. Um, let's go. very different kind of video there. Felix, that was your video, um, Mindfulness Wildlife. Uh, do you want to just quickly um, tell us a bit about, you know, what motivates your passion for sort of wildlife photography? Um, of course. <clears throat> yeah, so that video was um, a combination of different video clips that I took from last year. I got into um, filmmaking in 2020 um, and I've been photographing wildlife for about two years now. Um, I photograph wildlife because um, I'm hugely passionate about nature and um, I think it's important to document um, what you know what we've got and and from the photos and videos that um, people produce it hopefully inspire others to to maybe see the beauty in um, our natural world, and you know, and give them a, an understanding of why you know the need and the importance of protecting what we've got. Hugh, uh, 
Do you think that film and photography play an important role in helping people to reconnect with nature? I think, yeah, that was really lovely and, and soothing part of my afternoon. So thank you for that. I mean, I, have I unmuted? Did I unmute? You're good. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, so yes, absolutely, I, I do. And uh, funny enough, one of the things we're trying to do, although it's not uh, right now, is um, is square this sort of difficult thing where it's ideal if you can get kids out of schools or out of their home environments. Um, and, and it'd be ideal if you could build that into you know to, to become normal uh but you know we're the thing that we're going to remember is, is that it's taken let's just say I'm, I'm going to be 50 this year so 50 years since kids were all outside all the time they could range a long way from home they their whole lives were built around interacting with na nature and it's taken 50 years to kind of point that actually their relationship with is entirely digital for a lot of people and inside and, and that's just and so it will take time to do that and i think film uh that we've seen there but also with Attenborough and the similar and I think animation and and probably also gaming I hate to say it but I think you know if you're serious about accessing everybody rather than just a few people like we every year we get a few school kids here and it's always really re rewarding but I'm also rather depressed knowing that how difficult it was to actually make that happen for the school the parents for the for us and then and then in a breath of wind they're, they're gone and they don't come back because there's, there's no budget or there's no coach or and so that, you know, it's hard to keep that. And you really want that to go through 10 years of education. So I think we have to accept in, in the digital world we live in that film and other forms of media are absolutely a key part of the journey. So, yes. Yeah, absolutely. And it makes it accessible to, to everyone, doesn't it? For those uh, that are perhaps in less rural areas. Yeah, yeah. And I think, you know, there's lots of ways to start a journey start a journey of change like we talked about the lady pulling up her flagstones but it, you know uh, it, it is absolutely one of them you know I mean, everyone was very affected by uh, the blue planet series that's probably been a game changer for millions of people to, to you know after uh, but and that might then spill outside and make people actually go and do something but um so it doesn't matter what the doorway in is but, but and i think it'd be ignorant to think that it that for most people that media is one of the ways in film mm -hmm. and media yeah, and another great thing about uh, sort of digital social media film photography is it allows uh, specialists to share uh, species that are perhaps less common or less known. Um, so, Martha, you have obviously um, uh, done work with uh, bats, which is perhaps a species which is not quite so commonly um, talked about. Um, you did for your dissertation um, the effects of light pollution on bat species, right? Yes. Um, do you want to just talk a bit about the importance of large spaces, um, sort of rewilding, let's say, uh, larger spaces um, to help prevent light pollution for the bat species to thrive? Yeah, sure. So um, my final year dissertation was, like Abby said, on the effects of artificial lighting on sort of bat activity and different bat species. And basically I did it at my uh, friend's farm. <laughs> so we sort of studied areas that were lit and areas that were unlit, which were sort of farm the fields nearby and around the barns, which had security lights. And I found a really interesting thing in the fact that sort of where the lit areas were, it was sort of smaller bat species. Um, so the more sort of generalist, so like the pips, which are very common bat species, whereas in sort of the unlit locations, there was a lot more var variety in the species that you could see. There was bigger bats. There was so obviously you still had the pips, um, but there was a variety there that obviously weren't adapted and hadn't adapted to sort of the light um, and were sort of more light averse. Um, and that sort of shows obviously that that is needed and we need to have areas that are unlit to allow these bat species um, to thrive. Um, so, and also just to allow sort of, is the connectivity of sort of habitats and especially when habitats have been so fragmented um, with sort of farming or of an agricultural building that's happening obviously at the moment. And around me, there's a lot of building at the moment uh, in Oxfordshire that's going on. Um, so yeah, it's just the, that importance and it just allows, especially because bats are a European protected species. Um, so we need to sort of, you know, help them out and do what we can. Are there any other things that have um, contributed to bat species perhaps being more threatened or the numbers of those different bat species that you that you spoke about? 
that perhaps we can be a bit more mindful of? So uh, the, the main thing is probably light pollution um, at the moment. Um, but what they have found, there's been a lot of studies that have found that actually different types of light uh, are better for bats. So actually, um, so the UV light is the one that they're most averse to, but red light, uh, they seem to be actually fine with. Um, so I, it's sort of, in a way you, you can either do, um, there's also been studies in sort of partially lighting. So if you light areas and then leave it dark, uh, for certain times and then you can allow bats to sort of fly across those areas when they're dark um so it's, it's all sort of about adapting um ways if we are obviously still going to be building just to mean that there is that connectivity between different habitats so that bats can still sort of thrive between mm -hmm. yeah awesome and just um keeping on the subject sort of light pollution but also human activity uh tom and harvey how does uh, human activity affect reptile and amphibian populations that we have um, in Britain currently or looking forwards when you speak about sort of reptile and amphibian conservation do we have to be mindful of human activity? I mean um, humans have been the predominant sort of uh, force uh, in Britain at least for the past sort of well, you can go back to the Pleistocene 10,000 years or you could go back to when agriculture got here about 6,000 years and what humans have done is is we've basically simplified everything so we've come in we've uh, cut forests down which is simplified uh, niches and, and heterogeneity within the habitat we've drained uh, wetlands uh, we've burnt scrubland and basically all of these impacts over thousands of years which is what's happened uh, have an incredible impact on on you know such a wide array of species but amphibians and reptiles in particular these are animals which on sort of a singular level are creatures of habit i mean they have uh, common toes for instance have go back to the same breeding pool as they were born uh, common lizards will bask in the same place for decades as long as there's sun um, and you know if you come into the habitat and destroy it you know there's going to be many different effects the biggest effect of all that probably man's done with in terms of affecting amphibian and reptile populations is the extinction of the beaver. I mean, the beaver is this unbelievable animal. It comes into to wetlands and, and creates, you know, an 80 percent increase of biomass of insects. Um, you know, willow tits, are a species of bird which is very on the verge of extinction, practically in Britain, it can be saved by the beaver. They open up the canopy, rare plants grow. You know, it's unbelievable. In one site in Devon, frog populations, frog uh, spawn clumps went from just 10 to over 680 within five years. I mean, this is an animal which is just unbelievable and we need it up and down the UK, uh, back to its former range. Um, and amphibians and reptiles, why we make the link between rewilding and amphibians and reptiles is probably because they're the biggest group which has got the most to gain in Britain. I mean, we've lost 30% of reptiles and amphibians within, um, well, ever since man arrived here, we've, we've lost multiple frog species and a few reptile species. But at the same time, they're incredibly easy to bring back. I mean, they don't need any sort of formal training, like, you know, if you were to bring a lynx back, you need to acclimatize it. Amphibians and reptiles have got the instincts that they need programmed within, within their brains. So let's do it. And I mean, you know, if, if a million acres is going to be rewilding and if we're having incredible projects like Wild East and uh, Somerset Wildlands and uh, Wild Ken Hill, for instance, the Nep Estate, we've got plenty of land to do it. It's just a case of just doing it. And we've got to, you know, um, push for, for reintroductions because reintroductions are never easy. Uh, but in the current climate of conservation, they're made even harder. Um, and I think that all comes from, you know, it comes from a cultural change. It comes from a cultural change of accepting animals uh, to be reintroduced. You know, we, we, we need to take uh, captive animals and we need to captive breed them and reintroduce them because that is the only way we're going to get many species back, especially in Britain. Yeah, amazing. And you've got uh, in the chat, you got well said, Harvey. So interesting to hear these stories. Hugh is saying, you know, looking forward to working with you guys at Britain Lake. Hear, hear, Harvey. So you've obviously got lots of people that agree with you. And um, totally right. I mean, you say, let's do this. Um, and another good example of that is the Kent Wildlife Trust, who, I mean, it's taken a lot of hard work. But um, Robbie, 
you're about to be part of this huge project, which is to reintroduce bison and wild boar um, into this network of um, uh, land, which has become, you know, now part of of the reserve where they'll be, which is which is epic. Yeah, it's really exciting. Um, so obviously, I haven't started yet, but I'm <laughs> very excited <laughs> to get started um, and learn a lot about it from the um, sort of just researching for the interview, really. Um, but basically, what they what they're doing is they've got this massive ancient woodland which was industrially and commercially exploited for timber production for many years sort of during the 1900s and so you've got loads of quite young trees um, planted in very straight rows um, which although looks quite aesthetically pleasing to someone who sort of might not have their sort of ecologist training it not, does nothing for biodiversity because you don't have any space so one option is to get people in with chainsaws to chop them down manually but obviously that takes time that tramples the habitat um, more pollution from the chainsaws um, so the other option is which is basically sort of the core principles of rewilding is getting animals in to do their jobs we humans don't need to do everything um, the animals are the ones who did it initially and we should we should just be letting them do it again it's cheaper um, in the long term it's much better for the environment so the bison are coming in not just because they're big and cool and will attract tourism but because they are going to provide a key service of knocking down the young trees that don't need to be there, creating openings. Um, they have dust baths, so they'll make a big open space and sort of get rid of any bracken or um, ground vegetation. That creates completely new habitat, which allows other species like the heath fritillary butterfly to come in, which hasn't so has been reintroduced to that area. But the bison are going to really facilitate that through creating those big open spaces. And it's just an amazing project to be part of in the next sort of few months um, and yeah my my role is basically going to be tracking how successful that is and monitoring how much trees are, how many trees are knocked down and how the canopy cover is reduced and how that gets going to positively benefit all the other species in the wood as well as just the bison. Yeah absolutely we've got um, someone asking will, will, I, will Wild East be reintroducing any big animals so lynx, bison, um, any keystone species that, um, like what we've just spoken about, Hugh, that's... Yeah, yeah, it's really interesting hearing about the project in Kent, which obviously, as you say, we've all read about, and I, I was in um, Holland uh, a couple of years ago looking exactly at th that behaviour that you've just been described um, as regard to their impact, and we, we, we're working with Africa Alive to see if we can maybe get a license for some around Fritton Lake. But the, 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 I think the, the point, the question raised is a good one. And I think from the Wild East perspective, raising a debate. So if you, if you did a panel now, and this is one of the kind of tr tricky ironies or tr tricky fl flashpoints. I was in Spain last year looking at tr tracking wolves and everyone in the towns, the, young, the younger urban majority, which dominate politics, dominate opinions, dominate fashion, dominate pretty much everything, um, all want to sort of, you either sponsor a wolf or want to see them in the Spanish countryside and and, and not just the wolf, um, the very hard bitten and really hard pressed farmers, there's fallen into two categories. You've got old ones who are just ending their sort of career and they don't particularly have any enmity with the wolf, but they just obviously we're, they're an obstacle to their farming business. And they therefore try and remove them the cheapest way and easiest way to shoot them. Some have guard dogs. But the young rural, who are probably disenfranchised and not well educated, kill them sort of in a sort of this is a macho kind of culture and hang them from bridges and with nasty messages. And it's really difficult because actually, uh, on the one hand, I think, well, I said to the Spanish guys, at least you're having the debate. We, we, you know, it's a tricky one, but we, we, we don't have it. And this is the, the point. And, and, and to kind of in a round way answer the question, yes, we, while this obviously doesn't own land, what it's trying to not own, but encourage is, is, is the debate around coexistence and bringing back and uh, um, these key species and finding ways if you're an outdoor pig farmer for example and you, it's a very very profitable business well although pork prices at the moment aren't great is with one ha fencing them in with one strand of barbed wire is uh, sorry one side electric wise is not good enough to fence from a lynx and so the question is you know in an ecosystem sense if the lynx is important then we need to find a different way or, or a slightly more robust way to looking after piglets so there, it's quite compromise and coexistence is the two key words that I think need to be talked about. So we would love to think that if we're successful, that in five 
10, 15 years, it will just become normal. And this whole, you know, in Holland, they've got uh, European bison behind one strand of electric on the Harlem Ring Road. Harlem's about the size of Norwich. Um, and, you know, on one side, you've got 200,000 people. On the other side, you've got free roaming bison. Nothing to really keep them in apart from the electric. And in this country, we tie ourselves in knots about beavers, let alone bison. And I think what that comes down to is, if you look at Europe, Europe is, hasn't completely eradicated all its wilderness. It's obviously bigger, but as an island, we kind of have, and for longer, and, and therefore it's fallen more out of memory. We're incredibly good, efficient and tidy farmers. We're very good at farmed animal welfare. We're incredibly generous at giving to pet charities. We're actually one of the smallest giving uh, nations to what you might call wild animal charities or what, you know, that kind of uh, natural regen. It's just not in our DNA. And I think the job of the Wild East to sort of finally answer the question is to raise that debate and push the needle to be more yeah. equal. I'm not saying those things are wrong, by the way. I'm just saying that of course. You know, we, we, we just have lost touch, completely lost touch. And, and if you, you know, it's, it's a big, it's a big, it's a big, it's a long road, but the urban long youth, road, you guys will, will change it. It's uh, tying back into, you know, say it's fallen out of memory, but this is where social media, digital, you know, yeah. the filmmaking can sort of tie that all back in by trying to inspire uh, these generations coming up, you know, the policy makers, the future business owners, the future farmers, um, uh, about how that change can happen. And by using, you know, social media is a great platform for that. So I've got, um, I want to just go back to, we touched really lightly on um, sort of communities benefiting of the land and uh, careers. So I just wanted to, uh, just Hugh, really quickly, um, we've obviously been able to chat to you quite a bit, which is great. And I do want to get um, the insights off of some of the others, but uh, communities benefiting off the land, that's obviously a very important thing, but making sure that there are careers in nature for the younger generations to sort of come into. It's important, right? Yeah, I, you, you phased out just for the beginning of the question. I'm sorry, I just missed the beginning. <laughs> um, future careers in nature jobs and making sure that the local communities, making that available for the local communities so that kids feel like there's a future in working with nature. Yeah, I mean, that seems to be a, a crucial thing and, and, and a bit perplexing, in this, uh, not perplexing, but hard in the sense, a bit like farming, um, but for different reasons. It, it's not, well, it's not very well funded in some cases, but it's quite often quite solitary and uh, solitary work where it needs one person doing quite a big, you know, might be looking after a very big piece of land uh, or, or a couple of ranges, but, but so it's sort of, but I think in education, there's a huge opportunity. And if it spill out into, um, you should, probably this is where you, you guys, it's the next generation can uh, be cleverer. Um, but I, I think you're right. If you can't sell it as, as being a worthwhile career that's attractive to be in, then it's an uphill struggle. Um, I, I think I, I'm, not, I'm not yet clear on where those jobs are, apart from wardens and rangers and, and, and that kind of thing. I might, if, if we can turn a lot more land wild, then arguably there's a lot more room for rangers and uh, I think education is really the, the biggest opportunity and, and there's also a lot of offset money coming down the track as you will know from carbon offset for things like size well if it goes ahead and there's a lots of so I think there is the opportunity I think just it's probably not my area of expertise about how where those jobs get yeah. um, but I think for me the exciting bit is education and sort of the crossover range, range of education yeah um definitely um, Martha, I'm just going to come to you quickly because you've got lots of experience of volunteering on various projects, uh, not just in the UK, but obviously abroad as well. Um, if you could just comment quickly on your experience um, and Hugh touched upon the various uh, avenues, you know, within whether it's agriculture or farming, but um, what are your thoughts on um, careers being available in nature? Yeah. Um, I realised sort of soon after graduating and coming back from sort of, sort of travelling abroad and doing all of those amazing experiences abroad and then coming back and wanting to do a job in the UK, I realised how competitive and how hard it is to actually get a job in sort of conservation and ecology. 
Um, so the main thing that I would say to people is you just need to try and get as much experience as you can. That can be with volunteering, even just reaching out to companies, getting in contact, just asking if there's anything you can do uh, to help out. Because I basically just learned really early on that it's, it's quite a competitive job market out there, especially now with COVID and everything. Um, so just try and get stuck in and be if you're passionate, you know, just keep going and just make sure that you're sort of contacting people and, and getting that experience and just being proactive basically yeah um Hugh comments uh, yes ecotourism and education but we also shouldn't forget uh wild farming as a phrase to describe the way we will farm in the coming years yeah that's a very good point um uh Robbie I want to go to you so you're about to start a really exciting new job with the Kent Wildlife Trust um how have you find it up until up until now yeah i got quite well very lucky and i managed to find something straight after doing my masters um, with thames valley environmental record center um, which let me sort of get quite a lot of experience um obviously from the start so i'm sort of coming to this very well that i was one of the few lucky ones who got in straight away but i think my for the Kent role, my top tip was so the job advert said um, at the very top, it said minimum years, minimum experience, four years. And uh, obviously, there are a load of other criteria. I had two years experience when I applied and I got the job. So I think just don't undersell yourself and believe, don't sort of be put off. If you don't meet one or two of the criteria, you've got to go for it and really sell yourself, get all the experience, as Martha talked about, whether through work, through volunteering. Um, through just yeah, sort of reading things, bettering yourself, getting the knowledge, but then believe in yourself and think, yeah, you're the I'm the best person for the job, even if like deep down I didn't think I was, um, because yeah, I had half the experience they wanted, but I still managed to sort of get it. So yeah, there is a bit of it's like a message of hope. You, <laughs> there are are opportunities you will be able to get them. Um, you just got to believe and keep keep plugging away and keep applying to things. Yeah, amazing. Um, and to you, Tom um you obviously have a different a bit of a different approach you seem to be educating based on your experience you you gain experience in south africa um and you know i think various other projects what would your advice be to anyone looking to work for nature um you know having you know going to university is obviously one route but um you know, do you have any other sort of advice based on experience learning yeah uh, definitely. Um, I definitely would um, sort of echo what people have been saying, you know, volunteering is a big thing. Um, uh, you know, applying for things, not selling yourself short, of course, Th that's all really like, it's really, really good stuff. And I think especially in this country, there's, there's sort of a, because uh, um, I come from Canada, and uh, coming here, um, I, I, I find people um, tend to be a little bit more closed off than I'm used to, I, I suppose. Um, <laughs> and uh, it, I think what everyone's been saying and, and my biggest sort of advice for getting into this kind of work and being paid for it, because I believe that it's very important that we need to be paid for this kind of thing. Um, otherwise, uh, things yeah. just fall through. Um, you know, money, thing, projects need backing. It just, it just is. Um, but I think sort of my, my most um, solid advice that I could give in terms of getting into careers is just build relationships with people. Um, and and you can do that through volunteering or through applying for things, but just chat with people, just talk with people, engage in conversations, much like what we're doing right now, <laughs> and build relationships with with um, anyone that you can who you know sort of has a vested interest in in what where you're seeking to go. Um, I think you know that's something super important. And if I have just a second of time to say, you know, there's there's a farmer literally outside our door who, when he moved in, we had a little bit of a uh, you know, we weren't seeing eye to eye straight away, but we just had a conversation and turns out he is fantastic. He's all about regenerative farming, conservation grazing, that's his livestock does. Um, you know, and now I go out there every, you know, once a week and I help with him and he's the first stop on our tour at the moment, you know, like crazy, <laughs> just, just, just talking to somebody. Um, and I, I think that's really, um, key, um, and, and, and trying to understand other people's motivations so that, um, you can, again, like I said originally, it's a holistic perspective on conservation, and I think that really helps as you move forward into a career. 
Yeah, um, you've got several people agreeing with you as well in the chat. You know, relationships is definitely is definitely key. Sort of networking and not even formal networking. You know, if, if there's someone inspiring you, I'd say on social media, whether it's Instagram or Facebook, I've definitely reached out to people, either asking for their advice. Um, you know, how do I get into a project like this? Um, and quite often people surprise you, they get back to you um, and more than happy to share their experiences with you. And even if you're coming from different places or you have different views on certain stuff, it's, it is definitely good to get that conversation, um, the conversation going. Uh, Harvey and Tom, I mean, you guys, you know, you, you had a big, uh, big mission and you just sort of went for it. So what, as well as sort of, you know, it's we had a chat during the week, you know, despite there being a pandemic, you're 17, you're also doing your A-levels and you're studying. What would your piece of advice be to, um, you know, someone that does love nature and is passionate and has a big dream or wants to get involved? Yeah, I think it's important, especially from our perspective, um, if there isn't a job out there or you're not sure exactly what career or where you want to take your sort of passion um, you should always try and reach out to people like we've mentioned reach out to people and try and home in on something that you can really get behind and something that you can really research and get all the information that you possibly can and try and do something that's a little bit different mm. you know people are going to try and put you down people are going to try and say you can't do this or this is too much work this is you need more money just just focus on something that you know that you can do and go for it if it fails bad luck you can try again but if it works then you can say that you've done something because too many people spend their whole life trying to go down the same road go to uni go get a master's get a job that that can work that works for so many people and that's great but not everyone it won't work for everyone and you've got to find your own sort of path um, that will that will suit you and for us that was definitely yeah. going down the business route um I, th I think that there's a massive value to just getting stuff done and i think that there's too much messing about in conservation especially in the uk um and i think the reality is we live in a capitalist society um, and if you can create a value around what you do and people want to pay for that service that what you do you're off to a massive uh, head start because the problem with a lot of conservation and I think this is starting to change now is a lot of it has re relied on donations NGOs government grants etc but because governments and people are realizing that wait trees you know make oxygen beavers stop flooding and you know naturalistic grazing saves species these are things we can now start to pay for and because of that, you know, there's going to be a lot more businesses centered around um, rewilding, uh, regenerative, uh, regenerative agriculture, uh, reproduction work, which is what we do. Um, and I think that that's going to be incredible. And it's going to be sort of a green industrial revolution. We're going to see a total change in the way that we do business. Um, and that's brilliant. And if you can basically make an economic incentive for the work you do, brilliant. And I'd recommend to anyone, if you can be private, form an organization form a company uh, that supports your work do that over joining an ngo ngos are brilliant you know they've got a lot of money got a lot of weight and and political you know clout or whatever but if you can do what you do you will never lose the passion because there's no one telling you that you can't do the job um, and I <laughs> yeah we've got an amen tom and harvey from uh on the chat and i love harvey and tom and yeah i think what you're saying really resonates with a lot of people um, what Sophia is saying, you know, keep learning new skills, diversify as much as you can, never stop learning. Um, so yeah, I totally, um, it's from someone that I didn't go to, um, you know, university straight out of school as well. I totally, I really do agree and understand what you're saying. Um, from Coral, uh, she's actually asking, how would Robbie, Martha or Harvey uh, recommend finding a graduate job? So, um, I don't know if that's something that Robbie and Martha, if you want to, if you want to just quickly answer for Coral. Yeah, I, mean, I can go first. And that, yeah, graduate jobs are sort of difficult and particularly at the moment, um, like we've just 
in my old company, we're just hiring a data assistant, which was my graduate role. And we had people applying with like five, six years worth of experience, um, which is obviously not ideal for a graduate role. role. Um, I think you just got to keep, keep an eye on what's out there. There are websites and email subscriptions like environment job and ecology jobs. You sort of send regular updates on new jobs coming out and just have a have a diverse CV and tailor it to every application. Don't just send the same thing out every time. Look at what's been asked and write a cover letter that meets every single criteria on there. And if you don't meet it, say, I would love that opportunity. Yeah. And I think um, another important thing to remember is we touched upon how um, your worth as as well, you know, not all graduate jobs are paid, paid jobs. Um, so it's really finding out what works for you and remembering your worth um Felix just uh also for you you know you you come in at the filmmaking photographer and before we move on to your next amazing video uh it's just chatting about sort of your approach to work um and tying tying that in yeah <clears throat> so um I'm not quite there in terms of making uh photography or film a, a career and I'm hoping to get to university in September to do a wildlife filmmaking course, which will help me hopefully get there. Um, what I've found to be most beneficial to me is just with everything that you produce, just put it out there, whether that's on social media, um, contacting friends and family about the photos that you've you've made, you know, and hear their feedback. I um, <clears throat> I reached out to Suffolk Magazine just to say, I've got these photos, what do you think? They said, yes, we like them. And, you know, I've managed to form a relationship there with them. Um, so that's been really good. And then with uh, Suffolk Wildlife Trust, I did the same thing. It's just like, I'm a photographer. I produce these photos. If you want to use them for whatever you can. And, you know, they've gotten back to me and I've been able to form these relationships by just putting myself out there as much as possible and not being afraid of, um, you know, of uh, what people think about the work that you're producing. So I, I think that's probably been my biggest takeaway from the past couple of years that I've been doing this. Yeah, it's good. It's just, uh, that's a good reminder that <coughs> the relationships and the net and the connecting with people is a really good way of not just raising your own sort of a, your own awareness of other projects that are happening, but also, you know, your own brand um, and whatnot. We've just got one great question from Hannah. Robbie, are you doing ecological networking analysis for the work in Kent? Um, yes, I will be. Um, so something I've done for both Berkshire and Oxfordshire now and will be doing for Kent is come, uh, creating a nature recovery network, um, which is a government scheme um, for sort of every county needs one um, basically identifying areas to promote wilding and nature recovery strategies um, and that involves a lot of sort of ecological network analysis and that's going to be one of my first projects at Kent and I've done it for Berkshire, Berkshire and Oxfordshire too so hopefully too soon to say whether it works or not but hopefully hopefully it will. <laughs> yeah um, she said she'd be very interested to chat to you about that is there a way she can connect with you? Yeah, I'll put my um, email in the chat. That's probably the easiest way. There we go. Connections. It just proves that putting yourself out there um, uh, gives you all kinds of connections. Um, so, Felix, we are going to watch um, another video that you have filmed and produced. This is a four-spotted chaser. A common dragonfly found in wetland areas across the UK. In late spring you can often see them flying around catching insects. Targeting flies that are close by.
on a windy day like today, this can become quite tricky. Dragonflies, however, are expert hunters. They only live a couple of weeks as a fully flying adult, so there's no time to waste catching insects and finding a mate. Their yellow coloration strengthens as they get older, with younger adults more pale in colour. Lovely stuff. So nice, um, Felix. Um, I really love that. Have you got any other videos like that that aren't just a dragonfly? Based? <coughs> You've got a couple of really lovely videos. Yeah, so I've done a few more like behind the scenes style vlog videos and that's kind of me just documenting my journey, I guess you could say, as a photographer and filmmaker. And, that forces me to always be in like the process of editing because a uh, big part of film filmmaking is the editing process. Um, so yeah, I've got a few of those and I have one other video on red squirrels that wasn't obviously taken in Suffolk. That was, um, that was, that was filmed in Warsaw. I have a connection in Warsaw, so I've spent quite a lot of time there. Um, so yeah, that's, that's really, about it <laughs> so far <laughs> no that's amazing and i mean your work is so good um i'm sure i can speak for everyone that um not only are they very peaceful but um they yep. they show how beautiful you know dragonflies are um something that you should hopefully be able to see you know in in your garden or in the nature around you so thank you for sharing that no problem um, we're going to wrap up, but I thought it'd be really quite nice to just sort of get a sort of one quick snappy line, one quick snappy line from each of you, just to sort of summarise. Um, we already spoke about why you think rewilding is important, but why did you get into, um, what is it about nature that really lights you up, I suppose, um, and that has made you want to make uh, Britain a better place for nature to thrive? Felix, do you want to start? Of course. Um, what was the question again? Sorry. <laughs> I was telling uh, something. Uh, <laughs> what is it about, um, what is it that made you want to help protect nature and make it wild again? Um, well, I've always had a passion for the outdoors and the wildlife that we have. And I've always, I guess, grown up knowing that it's very important that we must uh, maintain and restore the wildlife species that we have um, and I've found through the photography and filmmaking that that is a creative way in which I can promote uh, the need of why we need to um, protect these species. Amazing so to promote and to protect species that's great thank you. Harvey and Tom? Let's do you know let's just actually get on with the job um, and i think that the science is clear the methodology is clear we know what to do we've got enough people to do what uh, you know to do what needs to be done i think a great analogy with conservation is the fact that we've got a lot of architects who've designed a cathedral yet we don't have enough builders to get on with it and if we get more people involved you know doing whatever they can to help rewild the country you know, we're on to a winner and we will win this because we've got some incredible passion that's behind all of us and that's what we need. 100%, amazing. Tom? Um, I think it's, again, like what Harvey says, it's all about getting people behind a project and getting people involved. And like we've discussed, social media is such a huge part of that. Um, getting kids inspired as well through like videos like we do, we do YouTube videos. Um, in quite informal videos it's just all about trying to educate as many people as you can 
because it's not necessarily that people don't want to help it's that people don't know that there are so many climate problems and uh, problems with species going extinct and declining but there are also so many solutions as well. there are so many solutions yeah and it's all about getting that information out there as best we can and that's kind of our job um, yeah. as conservationists or whatever you want to call yourself um getting that information out there because we can make a difference individually but together yeah. we can make much a much more larger and massive difference and that is what we should do and try and strive towards Amazing education, Hugh. Do you agree with that? Education is a is uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it was uh, Teddy Blair who's gone about education, education. But it, but it is absolutely the ground, entry level, ground level. If if it if we can't get a system where people grasp the basics the, at, at an educational level, then it's very hard really to get a mass movement of change. And I think that's a huge challenge, and that's certainly kind of why 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 I am in it and inspired to be in it to to make that help make that change. Because as um, Harvey was saying, we know everything we need to know. There's no, there's maybe difference of opinion, it, but it's cultural change and uh, towards coexistence. And I think the other one for me, the, the way the way in, you mentioned the way in, why, why, why? And I suppose me, you know, I've had an amazing life, a very privileged life out on the farm. And, you know, it's fed me, clothed me, educated me. And yet, I, I, you know, I'm the first to admit our farming system was, like most, was incredibly destructive to, towards nature. And so I absolutely have a debt. Um, and, you know, and I'm sort of slightly horrified by the damage that I, you know, in, I've unwittingly caused, not me, me, my father, my family and in our little patch and absolutely wanting to fix that is what drives me. Amazing. And hopefully, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, Martha, what's your why? <laughs> so I think I basically agree with every comment that's been said. It's all been amazing. That The passion as well drove me to sort of get into conservation and ecology. And I think yeah, the main thing for me so is, passionate. It's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> and I think the main thing for me is, yeah, I just want to be there to sort of know that I've made a positive contribution, especially because my love is sort of for animals. So knowing that I've done something and that I've helped sort of educate people or engage people to be passionate as well um, in sort of that area is just what I sort of strive to be and what I'd be happy to sort of say that I've done in my life. Yeah, amazing. Thank you. And Tom, lastly. Yeah, um, I honestly, I think the biggest thing um, for myself and, and, and for Ashley as, as well, who helps run the tours with me, um, is, um, you know, sort of just re like, like I've said, reestablishing that, that connection people have um, with, with nature and um, the value that it has for us as people, um, not just from a monetary standpoint, um, but from you know, reconnecting to our ancestors, reconnecting to not, it doesn't even have to be our ancestors, just literally like our grandparents or the people who came before us who relied so heavily on um, what was around them kind of thing, right? Um, and I, I think that's kind of the biggest reason why I would hate to see us keep going in the direction we're going in and I'd rather it go back to something like rewilding. Thank you. And Robbie, your wife? Yeah, I for me, it's about stopping humans doing things that we don't need to do. We don't need to cut down trees. We don't need to um, restore wetlands because there's animals that will do it for us. And it makes it way more interesting, way better to visit and way cheaper. So it's about giving those areas back to the wildlife so that they can do all the restoration for us. So they can have that area for them and not the human centric habitat it's an animal centered one yeah right and just giving up a bit of control to allow nature to do exactly what um it's meant to do brilliant well everyone thank you all so much this has been such an awesome session i've really enjoyed um chatting to you all it would be great to know if um everyone that's tuned in um and the panel did this session further your understanding of the topic amazing so did this session further your understanding of the topic definitely way i'd love a longer session yeah i think i definitely would love a longer session right so i'm, I'm just here to give a bit of a lowdown of what's happening next so it was a really interesting discussion and to see kind of how rewilding is happening here in suffolk um next we've got um at four o'clock veganism planet friend or foe 
which looks like it's going to be a really interesting discussion. Um, the vegan scene may not have exploded in Suffolk yet, but the benefits to veganism are certainly well documented. But in this discussion, we'll be talking about how um, the environmental and nutritional impacts of plant-based diets, um, like how impactful they are and whether it's realistic that veganism will go mainstream. Um, so in this session, we will explore the pros and cons with Glenn Burrows, who's from The Ethical Butcher, student and environmentalist Izzy Hoxson and Jaya Gordon Moore, who will also be giving us some live music. Um, so if you guys could sign up to our mailing list to hear about future events um, and follow us on Instagram, Facebook or Twitter, um, and it's at Siren Calling. Uh, there's a link in the chat from Sophia to all the um, tickets for the rest of the events. Um, yeah, and then so on, we've got veganism, planet friend with foe, and then later on we've got is sustainable fashion affordable um, with some live music from Jordan Lee. And then tomorrow we have um, who has the time and money to eat locally grown food. Um, we also have does reducing your waste make a difference, which will be really interesting. Um, Mama Cherry's coming to that talk and she was on Gordon Ramsay's Kitchen Nightmares and she's made this big company for herself and that was really interesting. And I think she's doing something with a sweet potato. So yeah, make sure to check out all of our events. Amazing, thanks Eri. Thanks again to everyone that was on our panel. That was such an interesting uh, discussion. Um, I secretly hope that we can have a longer session at some point in the future. Thanks for everyone that commented and that if everyone that's tuned in and if you do fancy checking out any of those other sessions, then you can go to our Facebook page, website, the YouTube channel. Um, you can share it on Facebook as well for anyone else that you think might be interested. Um, thanks again. And um, I may be seeing some of you on the next session, which is Fast the Fashion.
Thank you. 